So good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, hello, James. Hello, Saul. It's a pleasure, James, to have you at my channel tonight. So um, I decided uh, to talk a little bit about uh, impurity of molecules. And I think that this is a problem for prebiotic synthesis of the first life forms. And I brought it up in one of the streams in the few days and then uh, Leo Filios, he said, oh no, that's not a problem. So I actually um, made a little bit of investigation today, today about this, but I didn't actually find so much literature in, I didn't have much time either to figure out what science papers say about this problem. So James, maybe you could give a word in regards of that. What do you think? Is that the problem or not? Absolutely, it's a problem because it, it leads to messy chemistry. And you have to remember, we do have um, very strong evidence that in these primordial types of conditions, um, the number of molecules that have nothing to do with life, that are useless to life, or very often detrimental to life because they will compete for reactions. They will, they're, they're sticky molecules that will attach themselves to those um, crucial molecules needed for life. It'll disrupt membranes. It'll disrupt um, polymerization. They will attach themselves to DNA, um, to RNA, to protein, and they outnumber the the good molecules, um, which we call the the biotic molecules, the molecules that we find uh, in living organisms. These abiotic molecules, these ones that um, are either not beneficial and most likely um, detrimental by far outnumber the biotic molecules. Um, when we look at the Miller-Urey type experiments where they just start with some seed chemicals, you know, like ammonia, methane, hydrogen cyanide, um, hydrogen sulfide, water, things like that, and let them just react with some, you know, electrical zaps as a source of energy. Um, the majority of what is made, you can go back and look at that Miller-Urey experiment. And um, they said that uh, it was, uh, mostly, um, you know, tar, asphalt, you know, these complexes, these um, aggregates of molecules that all just kind of stick together into a bunch. And uh, the other molecules they made were, uh, well, you know, you have formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide, which are two known poisons. <laughs> you know, if, if you're uh, generating um, cyanide, you know, that, that's a chemical weapon. Um, now, it doesn't affect, it only affects uh, cells with uh, mitochondria. Um, or, or that have a, um, the electron transport chain, so bacteria as well. It disrupts the complex four in that chain. And formaldehyde, we use an embalming fluid. It's a, it's a cross-linker. It makes the proteins um, cross-link and nothing grows in it. That's why we use it to preserve specimens in it. But uh, it is a seed material to make uh, sugars um, abiotically. So it's, it's necessarily there, but um, uh, those original the glassware from those experiments were reanalyzed uh, years later once we had better technology like mass spectrometry and when they were run through these machines they found that there was you know over 10,000 um, abiotic molecules and and mostly uh, uh, aggregates for just a handful of, of crucial molecules like a couple of amino acids and a few sugars um, you know, the things that life needs to make uh, DNA and uh, proteins. Um, and then we look at the meteorites, the carbonaceous meteorites, like the famous Murchison meteorite. I think it was found in 1969 in Australia. And um, about 1% of that meteorite was, was carbon material, organic material. Um, they found um, dozens of different amino acids, um, you know, most of them not the kinds of amino acids that we use in life today to make protein. So they're non-proteinaceous amino acids. It's just a molecule that has an amino group containing a nitrogen and a carboxyl or carboxylic acid uh, um, group on it as well. So any molecule that has both of those is an amino acid, but uh, most of them that are produced abiotically are not used to make um, proteins. So you've got a problem there because when you're trying to um, assemble a protein through without uh, ribosomes, you know, in this uh, primordial uh, condition in, in, or in a protocell or something, it's just going to be a random well, not even random arrangement, it's gonna be selected by physical and chemical selectivity. So the amino acids that are nonpolar will tend to be linked up to each other, including the ones that we don't find in proteins today, 
And you also find um, them linked up based on how much the functional groups will, will crowd each other. So if there's a big bulky chemical group right here and it's gonna interfere with another bulky chemical group sticking off that amino acid, they're gonna repel each other and they won't attach to each other as much as you know a, a very simple amino acid like glycine, which just has a hydrogen as its functional group or alanine, which just has a, a, a methyl group, a carbon and, and three hydrogens. So um, chemical selection is going to favor you know, the more stable molecules and the order of the amino acids is going to be based more on their relative abundance. Um, you know, the higher, uh, so if some amino acids are made at higher concentrations than others, those are going to be the ones next in line to form these chains. And the, the, there's no uh, biological or functional selection at that point. It's just, you might make a random protein that folds yeah. into garbage the vast majority of the time, even when you take a, a one of our proteins that we know works and you heat it up, you denature it and you let it cool down again, more, more often than not, it won't fold back in the same exact three dimensional shape. Now take in the fact that you've got thousands and thousands of other molecules besides amino acids that are going to bind to this growing chain, whether it's a, a chain of, of um, nucleotides that are gonna form RNA or DNA or a chain of um, uh, amino acids to form a protein, polypeptide, these polymers, as they're being assembled, are going to have their reactions stopped all the time. Um, let's say you have, you know, these amino acids have sort of a left side of them and a right side. So the amino group and the carboxyl group. Well, what if the carboxyl group came off? What if it got oxidized to CO2 and came off of there? So now it's like trying to form a chain of people, um, but someone came in who's an amputee and is missing one of their arms, there goes the end of the chain. And the, tr the chain gets truncated because it can't grow anymore. Um, or what if instead of a person, you know, uh, someone grabbed onto a, a tree full of sap and their hand got stuck to it and now you can't <laughs> uh, continue that chain. That's what these dirty chemicals, these abiotic molecules are gonna do to the chemistry there. Um, when we look at the Murchison meteorite, we see uh, more than 10,000 different compounds there. Only a small handful of them are useful to life. And then even in um, in silico experiments where they use computers to uh, simulate chemical reactions. Um, there was a, a paper published a few months ago where scientists developed this computer program called Alchemy. It's kind of a play, a play on the word from uh, the old alchemists that thought you could you know, somehow chemically react elements together to make uh, gold. And so this is ALL like all chemi and in these experiments, um, they'll start with, uh, you know, six or so of the molecules thought to be present in the origin of life. And after one generation, you know, some of those will react and they, they program this computer to analyze um, all the known chemical reactions of those molecules. And you get, you know, maybe a, a dozen or so um, new molecules. And then you, the, with those new molecules, you'll let them react. And then you have a second generation so in that generation, you get even more molecules. And um, after about seven generations, <clears throat> you get um, 36,685 molecules, but only 82 of those are used in life. So just after seven generations, you have 446 times as many useless or detrimental molecules as the molecules that are needed by life. And so um, that's not, uh, seven generations isn't even gonna get you to the basis of DNA, you know, you need, you know, oh, probably four, 14 relevant? generations. Uh, hmm? Let them finish, oh, please. Let them uh, finish, just saying, please, please, because, uh, because, can, because, ask, because please, if okay? the sample size of, if, if the sample size is infinite, uh, just throwing that out there, if the sample size is infinite, you have way more than enough, uh, you know, stuff that's going to do what you're looking for it to do out of the math you're giving. So if you're not giving a sample size, how is it even relevant? What percentage? Is the thing because it's not for. unlimited. There's only so many con, um, hot little pools on Earth that you could even create some of these reactions. Well, There's only so many meteorites that. Pool. Hold on, I'm talking. <laughs> let me finish my thought. Well, what about the yeah, let him finish, please. Donald, let him finish, okay. please. Okay. People who are watching this questions. want to That's hear both your opinion and like my opinion, over and if we're yeah, both talking yeah, over no. each other, I just it's going to take a lot longer, and I don't have a lot of time today. I just wanted to point that out so you can clarify. And thank you. Okay. So it's not an un unlimited supply of molecules. And even if you did have an unlimited supply of molecules, it's a probability problem. You've got 
among all of these uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, really uh, trillions, because in this experiment, they only put in molecules that we know of. And organic chemists you know, have identified 150 million or so organic compounds, but there's many more possibilities. Of course, most of those aren't used in life. Um, but um, when we've got them outnumbering the useful ones by many thousand folds to one, then when they're assembling, the likelihood of getting not only the correct amino acid uh, in sequence, uh, the acid, amino acids in sequence to form a functional protein. And yes, there's you know millions of functional proteins. You think about all the different enzymes and ways that they can Endless. do chemical reactions. Um, so the, um, there, there's lots of uh, possible useful configurations or sequences, but there's many more times of just using the 20 proteinaceous amino acids that if you put them in a random order will not have a function. They will not fold into something. They will have no selective advantage that, that where those molecules can be selected for. Now throw in um, all the other amino acids that have nothing to do with proteins or other amino groups or carboxyl groups that are going to um, uh, step in place of these building amino acids these, as they're growing and you've compounded the, pro uh, the, the problem. So Sal has a good illustration with Scrabble letters um, and, and that's just using letters that are in the English language. This would be like, not only do you have the Scrabble letters, but some of the letters are typed on backwards. Some of the letters are in Korean. Some of them are in, you know, uh, Arabic. Some of them are in Klingon. Some of them are just scratches and mean nothing. And you're randomly taking letters out of that pile and, and trying to make words. But in that pile, you know, there's say like, uh, 10,000 times as many of these foreign letters or backwards letters or damaged letters as the ones you actually need to make the protein. So just by probability, when you're trying to assemble those into a polymer, um, the, uh, every, every one of those chances, you know, even if it was, if you were only dealing with the left-handed 20 amino acids found in proteins, there's a one in 20 chance of getting the right one, or maybe less if you, you put in like one hydrophobic amino acid for another and it still is able to function or, you know, depending on what your target is, if, you know, if you're just trying to get a, like a, a carboxylase or a decarboxylase or something, you know, there might be several ways of, of doing that, but you're, you're still talking about uh, a very low probability of getting, let's say there's, you know, five possible amino acids that could go in the next position and form a potential protein, but you've, you've got, you know, five out of a thousand letters are going to to, to be the probability of putting that right one in the next spot. So you can see, you know, getting, when you look at the average size of, of proteins uh, today, 300 to 400 amino acids long, and yeah, maybe a protocell would be, get by with a shorter uh, protein or a ribozyme or something, but there, there is a minimum length at which you need to have a sequence that can fold into three-dimensional shape in order to form a enzyme-like function, a catalytic function. Okay, go ahead. So, Sal, what would you like to add or to what uh, James said? In, in forming uh, nucleotide sequences, uh, they have to be orderly enough so that they can be machine readable for replication, transcription, and translation. That's something that Change Tan pointed out. She is a physical organic chemist. And so the problem of uh, having the right nucleotides available because there are many ways to form them where you can join the phosphate group with the uh, nucleobase and the uh, deoxyribose. Uh, they can form many ways, but then also when they when we attempt to polymerize them, uh, and that's assuming they polymerize because they could connect so many different ways that they don't even f form a polymer. There's uh, any, any, sort of, uh, any sort of machine and that's that is a that, that is a major problem. So uh, th that's in addition to just all the all the contaminants. The reason we know that is when Craig Ventner was trying to make artificial synthetic life, he he would have uh, synthetic sequences that were that he conceived of actually copied from a pre-existing organism, had it in a computer. He'd hire a laboratory to synthesize the sequences. One of the major problems that Dr. Tan alluded to, it's very similar to the, in the, in the DNA synthesis, they use the blue heron process of synth synthesizing DNA. They can only do about 100, 
um, nucleotides at a time. The, the problem was they had to prevent the, the bonding from happening in the wrong orientation of the added nucleotide. They also had to have purified nucleotides because if you had nucleotides that were not formed like the other ones, in terms of the deoxyribose, the phosphate groups, and the nucleosides, you could have a total mess. It's not going to be readable. So, so the problem that's a slightly different problem than just the pure, the purity of the compounds, but it will affect it. Okay, so molecular has a question here, Saul. Can you answer Could it? Could I that? respond to either of them? Yes, let's just uh, respond to him, and then I give you the word. Okay, Donald. Okay, Sal, that's true for modern cells. How do you respond to models describing replication in the absence of ex extant replication machinery? Those models, like the RNA world, um, don't lead to cells. That's irrelevant. And there are a lot of experiments and papers like that. And it's just really not helpful. It's misleading. Not to mention that the problem, again, with the RNA world is temperature. These things have half-lives. Uh, these things can fall apart. In these replicators, you, you, you basically have already pre-synthesized huge polymer, polymers. You're not starting off with individual uh, uh, nucleotides, RNA nucleotides. So uh, why cite these irrelevant experiments that don't lead to life as we know? We're trying to solve the problem of the origin of life, not trying to make a replicator that's ir irrelevant. So um, you just answered citing yourself. those papers do not, citing those experiments and papers are, are irrelevant, except for the fact they help mislead the public that they're actually making progress. No, that's not misleading the public. And yes, they are making progress. What you're, what, what, okay, let me go back to James first. Um, James, James was uh, ignoring natural tendencies, which make a process less random. So if you have a little pond, and it doesn't have to be a little pond, it could be a huge ocean, but if you have a little pond where you've got some chemistry going on, that chemistry is not random chemistry because random chemistry isn't a thing. Partially random chemistry is a thing. Chemistry has tendencies because molecules have certain ways that they attract each other and repel each other, and they tend to behave in certain ways around each other. So... Um, so there's that to be taken into consideration. And then there's the scale to be taken into consideration. Are you talking about a lab sample or are you talking about a world, a, a planet like this one? Or many planets where maybe it, maybe life will only arise on one planet out of many. And then, then you have, you know, um, uh, you know, Sal was talking about uh, these experiments that, that produce only one portion of what's needed to have cellular life. Well, life doesn't have to be cellular. There's no requirement for life to have cells. If you have a molecule that can be replicated in its environment, that's that's really all it takes. That molecule can replicate. And if that rep if that molecule can be replicated imprecisely, that means that you can get variations of that molecule. And when we're talking about now, I wouldn't go as far as RNA for a starting point. I'd start with protein because proteins are capable of self catalyzing. And if you have a protein that is being imprecisely replicated, sometimes precisely, sometimes not precisely, if it's not reliable that it's going to be replicated precisely, evolution of that protein will happen over generations and diversification of that evolution will happen. And it is inevitable if you have enough of them, you will eventually get one that is capable of self-catalyzing, which then speeds up the process. Once you've sped up the process, then it takes a whole lot shorter time for this kind of stuff to happen. And if you have a bunch of stuff that isn't doing that, that becomes parts for the stuff that is doing that. So it doesn't take long beyond that point to, ha to have the percentages change quite drastically. And once those percentages change, then you have a, a, a tendency for something like RNA to form. It would make sense for RNA to form in that environment. So all of these experiments are just they're, they're finding out what, what tools nature is capable of using. It doesn't mean that they know which tools nature did use because we can't, we can't directly observe the past and say, this is what happened. What we can do is we can find out what nature is capable of. And nature is very much capable of producing life. As a matter of fact, they have already produced life. Abiogenesis has been accomplished. What they haven't done is produced 
cellular life yet from from just plain chemistry. Now they have produced cellular life by taking a cell and taking out the stuff, some of the stuff that keep, makes it alive, and replacing that with other stuff that they that they made pure purely, uh, you know, chemically in a lab. Uh, as you know, he was mentioning Bentner's work where um, you know the, the DNA was literally put into a the, the sequence was put into a computer so you're not even working with chemistry anymore and then that sequence was modified it was stripped down they added the signature to it uh, they, they made some other changes to it and then they took this changed DNA and they put it in into a cell that didn't have any DNA and basically booted it up and they produced cellular life that way uh, from a dead cell and DNA that was produced in a lab. Um, not produced by a cell, by the way, not produced by life even. That was DNA that was produced from from uh, data on a computer. And so, yes, all of the steps have been done to produce cellular life, but they haven't been chained together yet. And a, a big a big factor that's really seriously important to consider is the size of the sample. When you're talking about a laboratory, yes, they have to, you know, they, they have to be very precise about how they're doing things because they have a very small sample size. There, there isn't really a lot of room for error if they want if they want to have their small sample size produce results in a human lifetime, which they've okay. done. Can but we, if you're uh, talking about if you're talking about, you know, if you've got a billion years during which the whole planet can do this without a without human help, the odds are extremely high that it will happen. Okay, James, can you answer to that, to, to some points made by Donald? Yeah, so first of all, I'll, I will give you the sample size of all of the pools and all of the planets in the universe. It's going to be the same um, chemistry problem. You, you know, all planets are going to have roughly the same elements of the periodic table, and you're always going to end up with way, way more of these uh, interfering compounds compared to the biotic ones. Um, it, really what is the bond the that holds ba uh, nucleobases together? What is that bond? It's a phosphodiester bond. It's a, a bond between a hydroxyl group and a phosphate group. How many of those millions of molecules that are that could theoretically be made in any of these primordial soups do you think have a hydroxyl group? How many of those oceans do you think have at least a small <laughs> amount of free phosphates uh, to, to do None. that? If it's if it's going to bind to say, you know, by chance, if you could even develop an adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, uracil, but you end up binding to some other molecule that has a, a, a phosphate bound to it or a hydroxyl group to that phosphate, you don't get RNA, you don't get DNA, you get and you don't need a, a little fragment of RNA or DNA plus total garbage that is not going to f fold into the three-dimensional shape in order to make catalytic activity. What is the bond Why between two amino acids? Why does it? Why? Why do you consider it garbage if it doesn't mimic modern life as we have it now on this planet? We because there's a reason know. why. Go ahead. We don't. We don't know how those chemicals could work with each other. What we do know is that is that uh, all we need is a replicant, a replicating process that that is able to make some mistakes or some errors or have some variance in it. That's really all we need. It doesn't have to be anything we've ever encountered. To get started and once it gets started it can then produce other chemistry that does likewise and lead to something like us or something like life elsewhere that isn't like us uh it, all of all of the stuff you're talking about that you're calling garbage isn't garbage that's chemistry if you look at cellular automata you can simplify this whole thing down you don't even need biochemistry you can get life like behavior in in rules as simple as conway's game of life it is chemistry. It's called messy chemistry because it makes garbage. The that heteropolymer with your part of the bases that we see today and part of chemicals that have nothing to do with life. So so like let's say you know. let's say you can get it to fold. Let's say you've got this mixture of 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 biotic and abiotic molecules, and it just happened to, you know, by some crazy um, chemistry, even with all these you know accessories sticking off of it that have nothing to do with the molecule can form a function like maybe it forms a bond breaks a bond then what how are you going to replicate that that's that's why we have the rna the way it is and the proteins the way they are because 
they can be faithfully replicated to get that same function over and over. If you right. somehow right. could get one of these molecules to fold in solution uh, and you've got one of them, how long is it going to stick around until a replication <laughs> mechanism that somehow recognizes this strange xenobiotic compound and can make copies of it so it can do its job again? Or do you have to wait for another molecule that can do the same job but was made up of another mishmash of uh, uh, biotic and abiotic molecules? You have the same thing okay. problem with proteins. The bond that holds amino acids again, together is a peptide a bond. It's an amide. Every time you have an amino group or a carboxyl group, they can form a peptide bond or an amide bond. So all of those ten, millions of molecules, anywhere there's an amino group that's free or a carboxyl group, it's going to step in and junk up this fledgling polypeptide before it can ever fold into something useful. And again, you've got to be able to replicate okay. that molecule if you want to keep using it because the more time you add, the more it's going to degrade. Uh, just having an abundance of water by the Le Chatelier's principle is going to cause those bonds to break. It, 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 the water will hydrolyze the phosphodiester bond and it'll hydrolyze the peptide bond. You're not going to get off the ground until you can quickly reproduce these molecules. No, that's not true. That's flat out not true. How so? You, you keep making you keep making these assumptions that it has to work like modern life and that it has to work rapidly. No, when you've got no competition out there, when it's just chemical evolution, that's all you need is the chemical evolution. Sure, it'll compete with itself, but if it's all happening slowly, then it's slow competition. And if something comes along that manages to happen quickly, that manages to do it quickly, that will outcompete. But that doesn't have to be there at the start because that can evolve slowly out of what is happening without that. You don't need it. It doesn't need to be. Uh, it doesn't need to be um, consistent either. It, it doesn't. It doesn't need to be precise. As a matter of fact, it needs to be imprecise. I already said that. It needs to be imprecise. If it was precise you'd have no evolution. If it 100% of the time replicated perfectly, then all you end up with is a bunch of the same molecule and it never goes anywhere. The, the imprecision me? is necessary for it to work. How much imprecision is a different story. Less imprecision is better because less imprecision can outcompete the stuff that's more, well, it's better under certain circumstances. Uh, the, the AIDS virus, for example, is, is a an RNA retrovirus, it mutates a heck of a lot faster than DNA does because RNA is a lot less stable. And that's one of its advantages. We have a really hard time fighting off the AIDS virus because uh, we come up with a, with a cure for you know a million strains of it and there are a billion more strains we have to fight because it evolved that fast. I mean, it, it evolves fast enough you can literally watch it evolve in real time. Do you know why RNA is unstable? Um, I, I couldn't explain it, but more or less, yeah. Hydrolysis. Do you think life has to take place in water? Is that why NASA is spending billions of dollars to look no. for water on other planets? No, I, I do not believe life has to take place in water. Um, as a matter of fact, I know absolutely for a fact that life doesn't have to take place in water. Life as we know it here on this planet, yeah, it's, it's water-based life. So, yeah, we, you know, this life needs it. So you know of life that's not on this planet that doesn't require water? Um, I know how life works. I know how life functions. Uh, yeah, it, depending on depending on, on on how far down. Like I said, if you're if you're talking about cellular life, we haven't made cellular life from plain chemistry yet, but we have made life from plain chemistry. We've also made stuff that that can be considered life that fits the qualifications of life in every way except being chemical except being chemical that is not even chemistry and uh and and that's something that I've, I've done a lot of and uh yeah that that kind of life doesn't require water because it's not even chemistry it and water is a chemical yeah you you don't have to believe me uh, i have a phd in biochemistry but i challenge you to find any other abiogenesis researcher that says that we don't need water for life um and well, these, again, these reactions again, take place in water. Yes, you need to deep like, dry yes, it out in order to there, form condensation reactions. But again, you're are only going to get these molecules yes. to diffuse and mix with each other and interact with each other if they're in an aqueous environment. As soon as they're in that aqueous environment, they're outnumbered uh, <clears> by, you know, like pure water is 55 molar H2O. Uh, how much smaller yeah. are these molecules okay. compared to that? Le Chatelier's Define. principle is going to drive the hydrolysis reaction, the, the reverse reaction. 
and break apart polymers. You cannot have life without polymers. Would you agree? DNA no, is a polymer. I would agree, I would agree with that, but polymer. it's very helpful. Complex yes, carbohydrates I, are a polymer and lipids are. I would not agree that it's necessary, but I would say that, yes, it's very, very helpful. Um, then and you can't have as, ribosomes, as as aqueous, you can't have proteins because they're polymers. As far as, <laughs> as far as aqueous, there are other liquids besides water that could serve the purpose in, under which you're using aqueous. Um, for, for example, methane in its liquid form could, could be a, a basis for life as well. And that is something that, yes, you, if you look, you will find other scientists that are, uh, that are saying that methane could be a basis for life as a replacement for water under certain environments. It all depends on the environment. And we're talking about Earth's environment and not modern Earth's environment, but if we're talking about a, the abiogenesis, abiogenesis that happened on Earth already, whether it was, you know, caused by a deity or by just chemistry or whatever, um, that wasn't in this environment. That was in a somewhat different environment. What is the polarity of liquid methane? I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. It's, it's a hydrophobic molecule. It's carbon and hydrogen. They have almost identical electronegativities. So the bonds that, are that nonpolar. It, it makes it like an oily substance. Um, so you, you're limiting severely the... Uh, the, the types of reactions can happen when you only have yes, um, I agree. a, a nonpolar solvent like that. Um, yes, now back, I agree. Back to and, the and random chemistry, I, I agree that, that, that you would need to have if, some... If I could just interject, sure, that, that's kind of like what kind of like what I was saying a little while ago about about the, the non-necessity of having something happen quickly, not, not necessarily having a catalyst that can make something happen quickly. Yeah, you're right. It's limiting and... and uh, that's not, but that's not really problematic. It's just a matter of it would take more time, you know. And liquid really methane is super cold, so all the reactions slow down too. But yeah, um, yeah. And so, but 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 keep in mind that Earth, um, as as we know it, uh, apparently, you know, based on the physics models, apparently Earth formed from a collision of two different planets. So the Earth Moon system formed from the from the collision of two planets that were much closer to the same size as each other than the moon, than the Earth and the Moon are more of that matter went into the earth than into the moon and and hence the, the size difference but um but that that means that life here on this planet um got started a lot later than than life might have elsewhere where where uh, such a late collision didn't happen and so if we do have uh methane based life out there it it might still not be anywhere near the stage that life here is at but it might eventually get there and it may have had a lot longer time already to be working on. Well, those, that's about all, all very speculative, but what, let's just talk about the RNA. Well, um, I'm not speculating, uh, I'm just pointing out possibilities. That's all. Uh, right, Donald, possibilities. I would like to give a little bit more uh, time to uh, sell a talk to James because uh, it is okay. a really a privilege yeah, to I, have I can, James I here at my talk. channel tonight and Sal has not had the opportunity. so. Sal, can uh, you maybe and, and ask some questions? I want to thank both the of them, questions. by the way, in case I don't get the chance later. Sure, yeah, okay. thank you. Um, Sal, can I say something about the RNA replication really quick? Uh, oh, please. I, I'd, um, like to, I'd like to hear you more uninterrupted, and then I have some biochemistry questions for you. Sure. Um, I believe the experiment you're talking about, oh, I'm terrible at names, but um, when they were looking at the, the self-replicating RNA strands, what they found in that paper is that the, the chemical selection, the functional selection in those um, uh, papers and the, in these experiments was that the, sh the shorter RNAs became, began to predominate because it takes less time to replicate a short molecule. And uh, of course, you know, you leave the molecule, the, the reaction to go too long and they just hydrolyze into pieces. So, you know, they had to take those molecules out and analyze them before they Hydrolyze. I mean, we know about the, the problems with the instability of RNA in aqueous solution because, you know, look at these uh, RNA vaccines uh, that Moderna and, and uh, Pfizer have made where they have to be kept at below minus 70. Part of that's because RNAs that would chop them in pieces are ubiquitous, and they would also be ubiquitous in a primordial soup because uh, w along with all the, the favorable molecules that you would hope to get or polymers, you're also going to get, um, you know, ribozymes and and proteins that are detrimental, like uh, endonucleases, exonucleases, that are going to wreak havoc and chop to pieces all of these 
um, you know, RNAs that haven't become something useful yet and they're trying to polymerize and along comes this, this rapidly uh, catalytic RNA that will um, cleave them into base pairs or a protease. I mean, there's, there, there's more than 8,000 endonucleases alone that have been discovered in bacteria. That's sort of their primitive immune system to chop up viral DNA and, and they, they protect their own DNA by methylating it so that the same enzyme doesn't work on it. So in a primordial soup, you're also gonna be randomly creating proteases and endonucleases that are gonna chop everything to pieces. Um, I actually have a paper by uh, Steve Benner that talks about that problem, that there are more cleavers than there are connectors. And that is an acknowledged problem in the origin of life. So again, this it's misleading to be advertising these uh, RNA replicators as some sort of success without acknowledging also the fact that it's, it's a dead end for, for things that Steve Benner pointed out. And this is known, he's an RNA researcher. So, but, I have questions uh, I wanted to get some clarification on with with uh, with peptide chemistry. So you're saying you had the carboxyl group and then the amino group. What happens when they're interfering molecules and are, are you saying that these things will be pre precluded from completing a peptide bond with other amino acids? No, it's a competition. So, you know, you have, I wish I could drop, but you have an amino group and a carboxyl group and when they, hit each other at the right velocity, the right angle, and the and you don't have too much water because water tends to favor splitting them apart. But um, a water molecule will actually be formed through condensation reaction when an amino and a carboxyl link together to form an amide. It's a carbonyl and a nitrogen attached to each other. Um, so that's what forms the backbone of, of proteins. But any other amino or carboxyl group present on any molecule um, including there's some amino acids that have amino groups and carboxyl groups as part of their functional group, like aspartic acid and glutamic acid have carboxyl groups that are what make those molecules unique from all the other amino acids. So it's not just the amino and the carboxyl that's on every one of the 20 amino acids. This is an additional carboxyl group that's part of the functional group, and that could bind to the amino and tie it up. Um, but you also have thousands and thousands or possibly millions of uh, Talked to Lee uh, Cronin yesterday, and he said there's probably trillions of possible molecules you could make with carbon. Uh, a lot of those are going to contain carboxyl groups and amino groups and other chemical functional groups that will get that that will be first to arrive at the growing polypeptide chain or the growing um, polynucleotide chain and get there first. So, like you're hoping with a, a random luck that and the laws of diffusion that there's only a handful of possible molecules that need to go in the next in line. So the next part of the chain to, to have some kind of function uh, once the chain is completed. But if another molecule gets there first by the law, you know, of just chemical competition and binds to the amino group or the carboxyl group uh, first, then you've, you've, you've basically stopped making your, your, your polymer or you made a polymer that's composed of, a part good stuff and part uh, harmful or, or useless stuff that's going to interfere with the folding of the protein. Well, uh, yeah, I, you had your hand up. I have a couple comments on that. So could, could I respond uh, to first one off, thing? In the formation. Um, no, I, I want Sal to have some time now. It, it's a really short okay. thing. Okay, I'll just wait. Then. Uh, please we'll come back. Thank you. So 25. Um, so one of the problems is with this random formation of, of polypeptides. It's very hard to build symmetric like proteins, like say anything like a helicase or anything where there's mechanical symmetry. I mean, we have them in biological systems that are multimeric. The thing that helps it is you already have, one has already a genome to be able to make these polypeptides. So once you form a polypeptide, the recipe is lost. There's no way to read it again and replicate it. So I just wanted to say that's moot. I did have a specific question. You were mentioning something about on other planets, what the chemistry, what would be the probability? You were saying something about phosphate groups. Did you say there were other chemical functional groups? I, I missed it. And Yeah, I'm just saying with random chemistry, if you imagine primordial soups all over the universe, you know, um, there's trillions of stars and each one of the stars might have a planet in the Goldilocks zone where 
you know, you have liquid water or all the elements necessary for life. Or, or you would, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's the same, you know, the same elements of the periodic table exist throughout the universe. So um, you're or going to end up getting um, this, uh, always a preponderance of the uh, abiotic molecules that are useless or detrimental to the chemistry. They, they're like chemical poisons, they're reaction dead enders, especially when you're trying to find uh, form polymers. And we're, we gotta, we're, we're usually thinking of linear molecules because that's what they are in DNA and that's what they are in proteins. But in a primordial condition, you're not gonna get a nice, you know, like trains in a car that all link to each other head to tail because there's also side groups, you know, carbon has four bonds it likes to form and there, there can be all sorts of side reactions. This happens in our body too. Like a lot of the proteins in our body, especially on the cell receptors, they get uh, glycated and glycosylated. Uh, glycosylation is the intentional addition of sugars to specific amino acids on a protein to make the shape even more complex because proteins can only make so many shapes with 20 amino acids. Um, glycation is what happens in, in your bloodstream when you're diabetic. That's when you, you have you know, normally about 5% glucose in your blood. If you're diabetic, you got more than that. And even with 5%, sugars are randomly, because they're, because they're chemically sticky, are gonna be attaching to our proteins in haphazard ways that cause uh, the protein to be damaged. It, it leads to inflammation. It, it leads to, you know, further down the road, you know, peripheral uh, vascular and, and uh, nervous system damage. And these are, these are bad reactions, we call them ages, advanced glycation end products. So this kind of messy random chemistry is happening in our bodies and it has to be cleaned up and taken care of. And so if you have a, a, a protein trying to form or an RNA strand in a primordial soup, you've got all sorts of other chemicals that are sticking here and piggybacking here and building this way instead of this way. And, and now how's this uh, strand gonna fold into a three dimensional shape? How is it gonna be replicated when you know, uh, uh, let's say you could come up with a, a replication system, a, a simple polymerase. Well, it's used to seeing nice, clean, straight molecules to make copies of them, but now it's bumped up against something and, and falls off. I mean, that's how we control regular, that's one of the ways we control um, polymerase activity now is you stick, our, you, our, our cells enzymatically stick chemical groups on there that, that knock off those polymerases to, to prevent them from um, continuing to do their job. Is, is that what's done with the uh, eukaryotes w when uh, they're trying to mature the mRNA? Is that what you're? I, mean, um, I may be totally getting. They that don't out. chemically uh, modify the. Yeah, it's the the DNA itself gets um, like methylated or set, uh, you know the histone proteins that are wrapped around it get acetylated, and that um, controls whether that DNA is going to be available for. Um, replication and, and then transcription. So um, there, there's all sorts of different uh, chemicals that <clears throat> are attached to these, uh, to DNA to, um, to regulate whether it's gonna be um, transcribed and translated. And, and the mRNA regulation is a whole nother story that involves a small inhibitory RNA and these, these risk complexes that uh, dicer, you know, that um, you don't want RNA to be sticking around forever and making protein. You have to be able to quickly um, block it by making a complementary strand bind to it and targeting it to the system that quickly just chops it into pieces so the pieces can be reused. Otherwise, it would keep um, being translated into proteins and you would get a bunch of proteins that you didn't need. Now, uh, just uh, be before, uh, one last question. The, the hydrolysis of RNA, I've heard about that problem. It happens, does it happen more acutely with, um, with single-stranded RNAs? Or yeah, that's part of what makes RNA unstable is that it's single stranded. It gets some stability, like DNA gets some stability by being double stranded. There are some double stranded uh, viruses. Uh, the, their genomes are made out of double stranded RNA um, that, that offer some stability. But there's also not RNA repair mechanisms like there are DNA repair me mechanisms. So that's why HIV and coronavirus and these RNA viruses mutate so quickly. I mean, we've got thousands of different strains of, of COVID uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus just in this year because of how uh, how quickly they get uh, damaged and mutate and um and um but that's just talking about mutation that occurs through replication i'm also talking about just chemical attack of the molecule um especially by water i mean you, you look at the what these companies say when you when you have uh, rna or dna and they're like okay once you dissolve it in water 
you know, get rid of it after a week at refrigeration temperatures because it starts uh, hydrolyzing. And, and if there's any RNases present, which are really hard to get rid of because they, when you heat denature them and cool them down, they refold into the active enzyme again and will continue to chop up your RNA into pieces. But. Oh, w one other thing on that. In Demeter's paper, he was talking about the cycling from zero to 100 degrees. Right. I was like, uh, the, the half-life of the guanines is, or, or one of the nucleotides is, is the most, 100 yeah. degrees Celsius. I was like, uh, yeah. did he miss that in his paper? I mean, you're not, you're going to have a disproportion. It's, it's not, if you maintain 100 degrees Celsius, even for like a few days, uh, you could forget one of the nucleotides. Yeah, cytosine. That's the most unstable of the, yeah, of the okay. bases, of the five bases used in right. DNA and RNA. Th yeah, thanks, which, which actually isn't needed. You. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Sure. Um, James. Yeah. James, if, if um, assuming that, that, that they, abiogenesis had happened at some point mm -hmm. in time, uh, assuming an, an environment similar to what most scientists who study that sort of thing think the Earth would have been like back then. If, if, you, if you dropped a human being back then at about the earliest stage where cellular life had started to evolve somewhere on the planet, and, uh, you know, assuming, you know, we're not saying the human being is necessarily put where that life started or necessarily put not where that life started, but put somewhere in the environment where life could start. How long do you think a human being would last in that environment? What do you mean last until they die or until they... Yeah, how long do you think a human being would be alive or that, you know, their, our cell chemistry would be able to sustain itself in that environment? Uh, Unless you, you know, have a way of metabolizing that, food, breathing that die. air, drinking that water, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, because you, when you're talking about that stage, there isn't much oxygen around, so you would die within five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, my my point, my point in bringing that up, being that you know, as I mentioned, you both seem to be making a lot of assumptions about life working the way that we're used to seeing life work. Humans sure, but doesn't, hydro doesn't hydrolysis work no matter where you are in the yes, universe? Yes, yes, the chemistry, I agree with you. The chemistry works the same no matter when you are, but what chemicals are around varies. And yeah, um, you know, cytosine, is it necessary? No, it's not. It, it, it's, it's no, it doesn't mean it's necessary. If it, you know, if it wasn't able to make it in a certain environment, if it, if it kept breaking down in a certain environment, life could go on and form without it wouldn't be necessary. And I, I'm pretty sure you would agree with that. Uh, I, because it is the same chemistry. You would have to uh, demonstrate it empirically that you can create some sort of information storage system with less bases. So you, you're talking about using a more robust version of cytosine, but somehow in the past that one got it wouldn't have or to, even though it wouldn't it even the have to have, of, it wouldn't even have to have an information storage system. I mean, if we have one base pair, and we can make chains of that one base pair. And if they can, you know, if they can manage to reproduce in their environment, whether they're doing it on their own or their environment itself is repro reproducing them by, by just, you know, like I said, natural, natural tendencies for molecules to attract certain ways. Either way, if we get replication happening, we, happening, we can get more of them. And sure, we're not going to get much evolution in the sense of the, the sequence, but, you know, you know these molecules have other stuff besides the sequence. So other stuff could still end up different, the way they're folded and things like that. And and in an environment that is doing that sort of replication, um, it's not just the replication that matters. As I mentioned, you know, we don't even, we would actually be better off without that, you know, as far as leading toward life like we have now, we were actually better off with replication that is not very precise at the beginning as opposed to replication that is very precise. And so, you know, as far as getting life started, that's a whole different ball game compared to keeping life going as we have it now. Life as we have it now would probably not have survived long back then. Pretty much if you dropped all of the life we have now one piece at a time into that environment, the vast majority of it would die pretty quickly. The molecules do too. They they yeah. just degrade. Um, there, there's yeah. you, you have no atmosphere to protect against you know cosmic energy. You uh, yeah. you have uh, radioactive elements to obliterating the molecules. You know there's oxidation yeah, and, reactions. And like I said, I don't see any of that as a problem. 
I, I really don't. Um, is, is it a difficulty? Yeah. Is it going to slow things down? Yeah. Is it going to stop it on some planets? Sure. But not necessarily on all of them. Life could still get going. And the thing is, for, for us to be here talking about it, it only, it only has to have happened once. One molecule had to have been able to make it somewhere on some planet at some time in some environment. That, getting that's, you have, a, you have a lot of faith, out. Donald. You have a lot of <laughs> that faith. That has nothing to do with faith. That has nothing to do with faith. That's recognizing the possibilities, and it's recognizing the diversity of environments in the past and the diversity of, of situations that these things could have and most likely would have been happening in. And, you know, we might have ended up being, uh, you know, being methane-based life. We might have ended up being uh, so, uh, silicon so why, rather than carbon So why is it life. not not more probable <laughs> that actually an intelligent creator was involved in creating life? Because why the intelligent that creator more probable? Because that intelligent creator would have had to have evolved first. And I'm not saying it couldn't have happened, but then we have to have an explanation for that origin as well. We don't have an explanation for the origin of the of the well, creator. Well, eternal and we also, creator and we doesn't also, have to. Uh, and we evolve. also he just is. and we also and we also have no evidence of a creator. So there's that. James, yes, um, the it's hard to convey why this is uh, chemically not possible. Maybe I can use a different analogy. Possible. No, it it's is like. Possible. Because you, you need know that. Kind of like your, your definition of life is please. very unorthodox. Um, I don't see how you can have life if you don't have polymers and you don't have information. And you're talking about life well, without those two components. Now, any polymer is going to have to be a certain length to function. And but those those very molecules themselves and the bonds that hold them together are un, unstable. It's like trying to make the empire, uh, a, a house of cards as tall as the Empire State Building or just a tall building, and you've got wind and you've got earthquakes and you've got things. So you might get the first or second or third level done, but no matter how much time and how many cards you have, you can't get to the length. And even if somehow it was a really calm day for a long time and you, and you could get it to stack up, that's just one molecule. It does nothing until it can interact with the whole system of molecules. So I think you have a, a very, very primitive uh, definition of life you know i think at life it needs at least needs to include um the ability to replicate and the ability to store information and having a high fidelity of replication it doesn't have to be perfect because you need that variability for chemical uh, evolution and then biological evolution um are we but not? huh I want to ask yeah. you, uh, James, would you not say that three components are, we are not absolutely discussing primitive life? Well, well, Donald, can I also uh, ask something? Because I don't want you just to, to, to concentrate on the entire uh, conversation. I've just been listening. So, James, would you not say that three components are absolutely essential for life to start, which would be information? Uh, uh, the basic building blocks of life or matter and energy and also the generation of energy is a huge problem. We need ATP and how to make ATP. I mean, uh, that is also an uns unsolved riddle. What, how, how would you exp uh, answer to that, James? I'll, I'll answer it with even if you took uh, a, the simplest bacteria or simplest cell you can imagine and it died five seconds ago, it's got all of the parts for life. It's got the polymers, it's got the information, it's got the molecular machines for life, but it, why is it dead? Because it reached chemical equilibrium. You have to be able to create some sort of uh, disequilibrium in the ions across a membrane to power the cell. And, and that um, does not require- it, The molecules that do that, the high energy, the molecules with high energy transfer potential like ATP, NADP, um, these molecules are incredibly unstable and you need massive amounts of it. You, the, you, your body makes your body weight in ATP every day and then it gets a phosphate and or two comes off and then it's regenerated. So you're constantly doing a turnover of, of it's like if ATP was like a, a battery or you know the battery indicator on your, your phone and you see three bars and you take one phosphate off, now it's two bars, another phosphate, you're you're losing potential energy there to do to what to power functions and so you've got to be able to recharge the battery if you don't have a recharging system you run uh, the, those molecules not only will they be used up they're just sitting in water they're incredibly unstable um look at the 
the um, the um, product sheets when you go purchase uh, these nucleotide triphosphates. It says, you know, once you've dissolved in water, throw it out after uh, like a, a week or a month at refrigeration temperatures because the phosphates come off of it. So they're unstable. You you and, and trying to create those molecules re requires such sophistication to regenerate them. Uh, you've got to be able to power these reactions. It's not just having energy. You have to use directed harness energy. You can't just say, oh, there's a, a thermal gradient between a hydrothermal vent and the cold ocean water, and that creates a uh, an energy uh, gradient. Um, or you know, that e even when you look at the the potassium and sodium levels in the ocean, those concentrations are completely flipped of what we have in cells because we have pumps that that uh, actively pump them against their concentration gradient. So if you don't have pumps in the membranes, if you don't have some way of creating uh, gradients and, and, and utilizing energy, you cannot have life. You can't repair, you can't grow. You, you have to balance the catabolic and the anabolic reactions. So let me ask you, James, some people say that ATP synthase was not required in order for life to start, but it could be just with fermentation and with the uh, uh, glycolysis uh, um, Glycolysis uh, metabolic right. pathway. What would, yes, uh, what would you respond to that? Is that possible or is ATP synthase absolutely required? Well, there's organisms that uh, can grow anaerobically. You have to have oxygen in order for the electron transport chain to run in order to build up a, the proton motor force to power the ATP synthase. So um, that's something that's a very complex system. So I, I would agree in their worldview when they're trying to come up with a simple system, there are other ways of getting ATP. Um, it's substrate level phosphorylation. You borrow a phosphate for one molecule and you stick it onto ADP and you get ATP. Um, however, it both the molecule that it got that phosphate from and the ATP itself is extremely unstable. They lose the phosphate. And phosphate isn't a relatively, it isn't highly abundant in a primordial soup. Most phosphates bind to like calcium and stuff. And so it precipitates and it's unusable in solution. All right, so, before your head so, explodes. <laughs> so, may I please respond because you, you, you I, I really have not finished. I, simply. I didn't, uh, Donald, okay. I didn't hydrothermal have vent. My... Hydrothermal vent. There's your answer. Hydrothermal vent. I'm muting myself. Uh, explain how a hydrothermal vent gradient, you have a temperature gradient. How is that utilized? That's like saying, oh, because I can set fire to gasoline that I can extract fuel from it. And... I can't explain it because it's, Otangelo keeps muting me and I have no opportunity to. So you explain it. You know that we need entropy. Is a hydrothermal Donald, vent or is a hydrothermal finish, vent not Donald, I a didn't sort of finish my I'm, question. I'm muting myself. Yes, I wanted to know, is ATP synthase absolutely required or do we know life forms which actually do not, know, do not require ATP synthase to generate energy? That's a good question. The, the problem is, is um, the ATP that you get from glycolysis is so minuscule that for metabolically active cells, it's just not going to generate enough ATP. They will quickly deplete themselves of all that ATP. So, um, you know, bacteria, they don't have mitochondria, they ha but they do have the, uh, you know, the electron transport chain that is in their, yeah. mitochond their, their cell membrane, their plasma membrane, just underneath the cell wall. And they will pump the protons in between that membrane yeah. and yeah. the cell wall. And that that's, um, you know, parallel to our mitochondria, which have a double membrane and those electron transport chain protein or complexes are in the, the inner membrane and it pumps it in between there. Um, so both bacteria and um, uh, eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells, uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes can um, um, have this uh, ATP synthase uh, mechanism, but it's, uh, it, it, the, the problem is, is when you, the metabolic needs outpace the production of ATP by um, fermentation um, and uh, just by you know glycolysis and other reactions that produce ATP. And ATP so is not just used as energy, possible. it's also the substrate to make DNA. You know, it's one of the, the four bases of DNA, one of the four bases of RNA. So you, you need R ATP, not just uh, as a, an energy source, but you need it for, uh, as a substrate. And, and it, of course, it's also what powers, you know, thousands of reactions in your body. Yeah, so basically it's not possible to have life without ATP synthase then. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, it is. I, I think it's uh, certainly complex life. You, you just, it, 
you're just not going to get enough. You, you get a net of like two ATP out of glycolysis because it costs you some in order to make it. Um, yeah. And you get like 36 to 38 ATP, depending on which organism. And, and, and if the electrons perfectly go through the electron transport chain and don't leak out. So a lot more. I mean, you also get some from the citric acid cycle. Um, but that that also requires oxygen, in, at least in the uh, aerobic organisms, like um, if I could with mitochondria. Yeah, go ahead, Donald. Okay, um, I agree with him, uh, but with a qualification: uh, complex life as we know it, you would not get without it, because complex life as we know it requires it. Yes, you could get complex life without it. It wouldn't be complex life as we know it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, Sal, you're next, please. I just wanted to say that the problem isn't specifically cellular life. The problem is building any any system that has translation, transcription, and all this integration. So uh, we, we don't have to be committed, just like there are probably infinite ways of building lock and key systems and also infinite ways of building house of cards. Uh, we're not saying that uh, life has to be built or a replicator has to build, be built only in this way. The issue is that we have a complex replicator with many integrated parts that are inter interdependent and perhaps on some level it's more extravagant than is what is actually needed to make a repli replicating system. So there are, uh, I mean, salt crystals replicate, that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's not very sophisticated, but it doesn't, anytime we just find a simple replicator, it doesn't mean that it will solve the problem of the integration. I just highlighted some of the problems with and it doesn't mean molecular it won't. cases or anything that is a multimeric protein or anything really even a monomeric protein if if there's not a genome that stores the information so that you could repeat the recipe all this discussion about uh, trying to have a protein's first world with a metabolism is already moot because there's no guarantee life is going to emerge you're not going to have mitosis and replication and reproduction so you don't need a guarantee the problem is the, the problem is it's not just and you don't it, need a genome excuse oh, me the, the Donald, is, Donald, yeah. if you keep interrupting i will i will have to remove you from the chat so please respect when others are talking okay yes. i'll remove so, myself well, i'm not welcome that, here because Thank i didn't you interrupt you much. you're talking dak no you are no, donald you are welcome but i really want to keep the rules and i want to give everyone the chance to talk i am basically not talking to give <clears throat> both of you the chance to have conversation with james he is a, a, a very welcome person here because he is a phd he has great knowledge and it's an honor to have him here so i want that both I of you have a chance to talk to him okay i respect both okay so, so the, ahead, but you keep muting me and i do not feel welcome so i'm leaving thank you otangelo well, you are welcome, as I said, but I don't want to, that people are interrupting. So the the uh, the issue is, I, I was talking about the complex replication cycle. So just because we can we can build um, a, a replicator doesn't mean we can build one as extravagant as as the cell. Even I could imagine other ways to construct the cell. Just reverse all the chiralities of everything. So, but it still doesn't solve the problem that you could build the cell a totally different way. That I mean, that's just one illustration that we could build the cell. In fact, the fact the fact that we have so many different architectures of cells from eukaryotes, prokaryotes, uh, the bacteria, the archaea, the chemotrophs, et cetera, et cetera, we can implement life in a variety of ways. But it doesn't mean. In, in fact, I would suggest there's probably an infinite way of making replicators. It doesn't make the kind of replicators we see uh, being highly probable because it, it needs, the way that this replicator works, it has, first of all, a, an information storage medium like DNA. So we, let's just say we imagine another system. It's still gonna be a problem where uh, we have to have a reading step uh, and some sort of translation to another um, chemical. Steve Benner pointed out, it's very hard to build um, really sophisticated replicators with only one kind of biopolymer. Uh, he said RNA sorted might make it, but it will not be like the kind that we see where there's this, um, uh, like you see in a molecular in the, uh, in the uh, central dogma where you have the DNA, RNA, and protein. And we can even imagine even more complex things. So th the problem isn't making the cellular life we have 
so much on on the earth today, it's making life of anything of comparable complexity uh, that has that level of integration. And just looking at a multimeric protein, uh, I, I mean, that's one of my current research interests. It's it's like how much has to go right to have these symmetric machines uh, assemble and connect. Uh, so if we implemented it with say different materials, uh, we would still have the same, you know, one could envision replicators that have also these complex geometries where all the parts fit. So even like, as, say we built a von Neumann replicator made of silicon and um, metal parts or whatever, we still had the same problem of making precise 3D shapes that have to connect to each other. So whatever substrate we use or whatever chemistry, there'll still be these basic improbabilities. Uh, so just the fact that we could find these simple, maybe autocatalytic, um, uh, these simple autocatalytic replicators, uh, it's misleading to suggest that it'll build something with a transcription and translation and replication system. Um, that, that's just not right. So yeah, you bring up a good uh, you bring up a good point about the interaction of molecules. You know, sometimes I think we picture, oh, if we can just get that one ribozyme that has you know autocatalytic activity or or you know, self replicates um, or you know some kind of protein that will do a job. But life is the interaction of those molecules. I mean, even just forming certain types of proteins with quaternary structure, uh, like you know, Sal, requires the production of um, uh, subunits that have to come together and interact with each other and they have to be the right shape so that they they sort of uh, connect to each other in a physical manner. They have to have the right pockets and openings for them to interact. And then the sort of weak interactions like the hydrophobic bonding and the, the van der Waals type interactions that will hold it in place long enough so that it stays there. Sometimes it'll get a disulfide bond to make a, a strong covalent bond. And then you get the, and it doesn't work until those parts come together, like the, the subunits of hemoglobin or, you know, even cholera toxin has five identical subunits that come together to form a ring uh, as the part that binds to cell receptors. And then it carries another, the, the actual toxic part um, as a separate protein that's attached to yet another separate protein that sort of fits in that donut hole <laughs> that was created. And so take one of those parts away and it, it no longer binds. And so every time you have uh, an enzyme, there's a substrate it operates on. Every time you have a, a receptor, there's a ligand that has to, that, that fits just right in that pocket. And, and then we're not, we're not even talking about the regulation of those things like the, the allosteric regulatory sites on enzymes or the um, you know competitive inhibitors that mimic the substrate, but um, are not turned into a product that that uh, by competition get to the active site first and slow down the, the production of products. And, and the fact that it's only the enzymes at the be beginning of chains that are regulated and not the middle, because if you're in an assembly line, you don't want to just turn off one of the machines in the middle of the factory. You want to stop it at the beginning or everything starts piling up <laughs> and you and you waste resources if you don't uh, operate at the, the, the junction points, the beginning of the reaction and any branching points in the reaction. And of course, that's where we find these uh, allosterically regulated uh, enzymes with feedback loops, uh, feedback mechanisms that are concentration dependent. I, I did want to say something, um, although I would totally agree, I mean, at a personal level, that ATP synthase is essential for life. I probably wouldn't make that argument in a debate. So I would, you know that I'm on your side of that argument, but then I just don't want to give the other side any. I, I think we have we have other arguments that we could use that are probably more forceful. And they I agree because it's just just getting to the point of where you can get the ATP synthase to operate requires so many steps before that. I mean, it doesn't operate unless you have the the complexes of the electron transport chain and they have the right cofactors and then the intermediates that carry the electrons from one complex to the other. I mean, give it to them that you know, you can get some ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, um, whether it's enough ATP to live on or, or their metabolism is just super slow or they're doing these reactions in super cold water, um, you know, like just above freezing, hypothetically maybe, but um, it, yeah, the a ATP is, is uh, it's, it's too far along the road when they're trying to just, just talk about the, the protocell. It's now, way I, too, I, ATP, they said is. One thing that I've tried to say is, 
uh, I had this exercise when I had um, this teaching ID at college, uh, extracurricular. And I just said to the students, I gave them a, a box of dice and coins. I said, just arrange it in a way that will scream design. It won't be mistaken. The way that I look at the cell, it's taking chemicals that are available on earth, but then it's constructing it in, in a way that, that's telling you this is, uh, this is not the product of random accidents uh, any more than a tornado passing a junk through a junkyard will make a 747. There's just, it's just too well organized and connected. That's the real issue. It's not that we are forced to make life only one way. It's the fact that everything is so well connected. So there are an infinite number of ways to make aircraft, but we would still know whichever way that it's made, that there's a lot of integration of the parts. And that's more of the argument that I'm, that I'm trying to make, because especially now that we have better, uh, structural data on proteins you can actually fit you can visualize the improbabilities because now we can visualize the improbability of the fold uh it, it's so easy to see something there's so many ways it, it you know something won't connect properly and and to have that correct fit so um i just wanted to interject that uh there was one other question i it's oh i wanted to point out ann gager told me she said uh, there may be causal circularity with ATP, that if you don't have ATP, you can't make ATP. So even with the glycolysis cycle or the ATP synthase, um, somewhere in the metabolic cycle, if you didn't have ATP somewhere to start to seed the system, you're not going to have any more ATP. And I, I thought um, for the viewers uh, here, if that's incorrect, please correct me. That's kind of an open question that some ID put proponents have thrown on the table. And the spontaneous formation a ATP is, it may happen, but it'll be in low concentrations. And um, I wouldn't count on it uh, being available. I've seen some origin of life papers talking about the problem of uh, for forming ATP. Oh, because ATP was adenosine triphosphate. So that means it needs an adenine group and a ribose or deoxyribose, right. depending on right. This. So you need an or RNA. DNA. You need an RNA nucleotide to begin with. <laughs> so it's it's not like it's a given that you're even going to have ATP to begin with. In my biochemistry class, I asked a professor. I'm like, okay, so we have one monophosphate, diphosphate, triphosphate, one, two, or three phosphates. I said, are there tetraphosphates or pentaphosphates? And he's like, well, they're they're rare and they tend to cyclize, but they're just too unstable. Even having three phosphate bonds next to each other, you have all those, you know, uh, depending on the pH that it's in, uh, it ionizes and creates a bunch of negative charges that repel each other. And so that, that phosphodiester bond um, uh, it, um, in the DNA and RNA will um, um, cleave just spontaneously um, rather easily. But yeah, just having the three phosphates back to back are unstable because of that. Those linkages are under some stress there. Oh, and the 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 costing ATP in order to make ATP. I think that's referring to uh, glycolysis. There's ten steps, and there are ten enzymes that convert glucose into um, two molecules of pyruvate, and um, you end up making eight four ATP in that process. But uh, two of the steps are energetically unfavorable, so it costs two ATP. Um, so it's like, you got to spend four bucks and then you get two bucks and out of it. Um, it's so is that two ATP going to be enough to live on? Uh, especially when you can't keep it forever. It's not like you can stockpile ATP somewhere because it's just too unstable. And, and um, so I, th I think the point was, this is also like the ch other chicken and eggs paradoxes that are a little bit more subtle that people. I mean, there's so many of these, if someone were just willing to catalog them, we, we've only, I think, scratched the surface. I think Ann Gager pointed out there's certain amino acids. If you don't have them, uh, none of the metabolic cycles would be able to make them. So there are other chicken eggs paradoxes with the synthesis of amino acids. You, you need that amino acid to, to make other amino acids. Um, oh, yeah. You need proteins to make DNA. You need DNA to code for the proteins. You need proteins to to um, process the other proteins. You need chaperones to help make sure the proteins fold properly. You need proteins to cut off, um, you know, like components that are 
needed to code the direction of where these things end up and then cut them off later. I mean, there's just so much modification that, that goes on that, that I think people just have no clue about the, um, um, how all of this is um, coordinated and regulated and, and how it all interacts with each other and, and just the sheer number of, of interactions by different molecules that are needed just to get the, the basic, like the foundational life going. I am uh, studying about the biogenesis of the ribosome, James, mm -hmm. and I think it is the most complex thing that I have studied in regards of biochemistry so far. And there are some science papers and at each second sentence they put in regards of something, a, a number, which is a link to another science paper, which is just uh, about that uh, sub part of the, of the ribosome. And I am just now starting to scratch at, at the surface of, of how this thing goes. And I, I am at that moment now completely lost. I mean, there are so many technical terms that I have to learn them before that I even can start to have a superficial grasp of that. But I mean, I mean, there are so many things that you see. Well, there has to be everything there Otherwise, it doesn't work. Like, for example, when uh, a ribosomal RNA comes out of the ribosome and is synthesized, then a chaperone immediately comes and binds it. Otherwise, it will fold and it cannot fold at that stage. So it prevents it to, 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 uh, to fold and it uh, carries it to, uh, to another department where then it is a uh, test. The, the, it, it's literally tested if it is okay, if it is a, a functional uh, part. And if it's not, then it is discarded in the proteasome. But if it is functional, then it is integrated in the assembly process of one of the two subparts. So this is high engineering. And if that has to come before life started, how do you get that kind of sophistication without evolution or without intelligence? I mean, this is completely uh, impossible in my understanding. Yeah, in graduate school, one of my professors did his PhD research just on the ribosome. And um, it's, yeah, you know, they, they talk about ribozyme activity and, well, could it act as a, um, a sort of translational mechanism? But um, because the ribosomal RNA is what is actually catalyzing the linkage of the amino acids together to make proteins. But mm -hmm. it, 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 it can't do that without the ribosome acting as a scaffolding as this, you know, there's two, the large subunit and the small subunit um, attached to the messenger RNA, but the ribosomal RNA that's woven into that protein of the ribosome has to be, I mean, basically that's the job of the protein is just to bend the RNA, the ribosomal RNA in just the right shape and orientation so that it can have enzymatic activity. So it can um, help form um, these peptide bonds between the amino acids. And I'm still learning stuff about the, the translation process. I, I just found out, you know, with, with all the different tRNAs and how there's a different one, you know, you have to have a, an amino acid attached to it. And then the anti-codon sequence has to match, you know, the, the codon and the mRNA. Well, I knew there was an enzyme that was unique for each of those amino acids and tRNAs, the amino acyl tRNA synthetases mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. has to be able yes. to recognize, okay, um, uh, uh, alanine is going to be attached to this particular tRNA but not any of the other, you know, 64 uh, uh, tRNAs. And, but that's not the only enzyme involved. I guess there's like a dozen other enzymes that are involved in just prepping that tRNA molecule to get it ready for action. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the amino acid has to be charged by the uh, amino acid tRNA. And I mean, it's Synthetase, such, yeah. A, yeah, and it's such a complex process. And uh, I mean, uh, naturalists, uh, they think that it can, uh, that that machine can form by a stepwise uh, evolutionary process. But I mean, I cannot imagine how that could be. If if you imagine that just the peptidyl transferase center, the part is a ribosomal RNA and it has about 2,900 RNAs linked together. How do you get that in the right configuration to have that center? And what if the little loop that forms the anti-codon sequence wasn't bent at just the right angle so that there was only three bases on the anti-codon to match up with the three uh, and the codon? Like then you, instead of having a, 
a triplet codon, you might have a duplicate, uh, you know, two or four or five, and it's got to be consistently three every time. Otherwise, you'll have frame yeah. shifts and get a totally yeah. different uh, uh, signal. And th that's why I like all the visualizations. You can actually see the improbability based uh, rather than just saying, you know, a vague fold of an RNA or whatever. Uh, like a proto RNA, uh, tRNA, yeah. just randomly it, forming in a in it, it a primordial have, soup. It, you can actually see the improbability based on the on the shape and what it has to connect to. It's just like a nut fitting into the into a bolt. Uh, Royal Truman mentioned that even some of these folds in the tRNA are not possible unless there were um, RNA modifications. So. Uh, the term is like A6-amers. I, I don't know what the, they call it an epitranscriptone modification. Uh, and you actually yeah, some, need proteins to make that, to make that modification. <laughs> Otherwise- yeah, sometimes they'll go through chemical modifications to, uh, I mean, not sometimes, yeah, I mean, but, but often. <laughs> yeah, it won't have that full, it needs that modification. That, that modification has to be on the right nucleotide and, um, that's not easy to do <laughs> to get it to 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 give it that right fold. Be that so, selective. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to just randomly stick molecule uh, chemicals on the other molecules that are uh, similar. It has to be very precise in its recognition of that molecule. Um, I b before uh, we close the show, and I don't know how long I'll be on. I just wanted to publicly apologize to Otangelo. I put him in a hard spot because I was complaining in the private chat that. Um, I didn't want Donald here, not not so much because I didn't want him to have his voice, but it's just so rare to have a biochemist um, talk, and 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 so I was a little bit rough on Otangelo, saying we need more time with Dr. Carter. So I just wanted to say I'm I'm sorry, Otangelo. I, I didn't mean to cause trouble for you, but I was interested in the quality of your show and our having ID proponents who are um, qualified. Um, yeah, I, I, like I, I, really, I, I, I really don't want that atheists think that they are not welcome at my channel. They are welcome. And I don't know if this also welcome. He said, oh, I'm leaving because I don't, do not feel welcome here. And I want to make that very clear. He is welcome as any atheist to come here to my channel. And I want to have polite conversations with anyone of any worldview. Now, uh, what really uh, uh, was difficult is to contain him. He started to gesticulate and so on. And I mean, uh, if it's not his turn, then just keep listening and do not try uh, constantly to intervene and to, and to in interrupt. And that was really um, uh, a little bit my concern. And I want to give you, Sal, also the time to have your conversation with James. So. Um, I, I, and I, I said to him previously, before he came to my show, I said, Donald, we had a conversation previously and you were interrupting me and I left because of that. So you are welcome to come, but please do not interrupt. And he was simply not able to keep to my terms. So um, he is welcome to come again, but I really want polite conversations here and without interrupting. So I'm, I'm really glad that you came, Dr. Carter. Um, what ends up happening is sometimes the the environment can be so hostile that scholars just don't even want to come to the internet. And I've been uh, watching, following you guys for long enough. I know the different personalities, and I totally do not mind. In fact, I encourage uh, opposing viewpoints because that helps us sharpen yeah. our own and make sure. Oh, I didn't think about that. Or that's a good point, and and hopefully we can do that the same. But what I what I don't tolerate is the constant interruptions because. It yeah. wastes everyone's time, you know. We that was my people, concern. Whether yeah. they agree with me or whether they agree with him, uh, I want to hear what he has to say. I don't. That's why I don't interrupt him because I want to see if there's yeah. anything that I can pick up on, or I need to be paying attention so I can give my uh, my counter response. And so when you're talking over each other, it's just wasting everyone's time. I'm I'm, I'm taking time away from my family and kids to do this. I don't want to yeah. just be extending this another twenty percent by having to re repeat myself. And yeah. and. I, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I do listen to what the other side says. There were some good points that the other side said that I felt had to be addressed in my debate last night. Um, my debate last night, I felt uh, everyone liked the way that it was conducted. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought both sides were uh, were representing their themselves well as human beings. And, 
um, they're polite and civil. And that's, that's more the, the way that I like communication. So uh, I just, I just wanted to publicly apologize to you, Tangelo. So um, no, 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 cons so. no concern. I think it was important for me to just to say what, uh, what my viewpoint is on this, that uh, Donald Dossi said, oh, I don't feel welcome here, or I am not welcome here. No, he is welcome as any atheist, as anyone, but really anyone should simply not interrupt and let the other side talk. That's, that's, that's really what concerns me. I, I do think that, you know, smaller groups, smaller panels, maybe of two or three work. When we have like five people yeah. on, it, it just starts to become unmanageable. Yeah, so I agree with you. It, my, so yeah. my sincere apologies to rational empiricist. Um, I called him some net, not so nice names and I'm sorry to you, rational empiricist. I was just getting upset because these guys are on the internet a lot on Speed of Sound's channel and these other atheist channels. It's just like, you know, we don't need a replay of that on on the on the Daily ID show. That's just my feeling, but it, it's not my channel. And um, it, 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 if I were stepping out of line, I apologize for that too. But part of it was, I'm really so glad just to see Dr. Carter here. It's been yeah, like I too. years it's, since uh, we had a biochemist, a professional yeah, biochemist uh, willing to interact with us because we have all these unprofessional these non-professionals uh, talking about chemistry yeah. and I'm learning chemistry. And finally we actually get someone who actually teaches chemistry. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, yeah. It's, it's so hard and, to do this without illustrations and, and trying to describe stuff. And I'm throwing out terms and I'm like, oh man, I probably just lost like 90% of the people listening because they don't know what that term is. So uh, may, in the future, you know, this is sort of an impromptu thing. Like a couple hours ago, we're like, hey, let's talk about this. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll join. and. So um, maybe, you know, I, I want these to be as informative as possible and not to go over people's heads. So, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, a, a new paper that came out or we uh, discuss the pros and cons of something to have it be, you know, efficient and learning experience for everyone, us included, um, then we're, we're not just wasting uh, gigabytes on YouTube and everyone's time. <laughs> Yes, and I mean, there were some interesting comments by Molecular Alchemy, and he's talking about like a five, a five uh, nucleotide ribozyme, and, that, I, and I thought that was interesting. I, it's like, well, I think it's kind of irrelevant, but it was still kind of interesting. The, the, fun, the function of that would be so severely limited because in, unless you can form, you have to have enough loops of RNA or, or proteins to fold into a uh, secondary, tertiary, quaternary shape to create pockets, to create loops, to create grooves um, in order to secure a molecule for it to work upon, to chemically react with. It's got to hold on to it. So that requires just a certain a length of your polymer to be able to form all of these little nooks and crannies and pockets. And so with just five nucleotides i mean how are you even going to be very selective in the type of chemical reaction that's occurring there it's just going to start randomly doing something to a half dozen or, or hundreds of different similar looking molecules see i'm glad i'm glad i put that on the table see now that kind of puts that wonder to to rest and this is what i see is they'll cite something like that and then give the impression that oh therefore all this can naturally evolve and that's kind of been my complaint with a lot of these papers. I said, yeah, a tornado can pass through the junkyard. It can make a lot of paperweights and primitive hammers. It doesn't mean it's going to make a 747. So a lot of these citations of random uh, poly, uh, you know, variety polymers, be they nucleotides or amino acids, and they, they say, oh, we, we found it had some use. It's kind of misleading to suggest then that you could build something really complex. It'd be like me saying, oh, look, a tornado passed through a junkyard. Look at all the paperweights it made. Therefore, we can make a 747 with the same process. That's just not, I, I have problems with that. Well, in nature, you know, you look at what is the shortest um, ribozyme. And I, it's, last time I looked, it was the hammerhead uh, ribozyme, this RNA that folds into a, a, you know, a secondary structure that has enzyme function. And I think it's, you know, uh, I, I try to look at the sequence and it looks like it's actually a conglomerate of several strands of a couple dozen um, nucleobases long each. Um, so, you know, you're, you're still talking about a few dozen long to get a minimum um, enzymatic function out of an RNA. And then it's very, it's very challenging to try to replicate 
you know, let's right. say you could get it once it's folded like that and it's hydrogen, you know, if you have a, a strand like this and it, it folds back on itself and starts hydrogen bonding right here to form a loop um, and this loop, you know, plays some sort of chemical role in, in whatever it does, trying to replicate that molecule, you need to straighten it out again. You need to, you know, unless you have an enzyme that can break those hydrogen bonds and make the molecule linear again, you've got to heat it up to like 95 degrees Celsius to <sighs> melt apart all those hydrogen bonds. You know, the covalent bonds that hold the bases together are strong enough to survive that heat. But all of the numerous hydrogen bonds that help fold, make these uh, loops and these folds um, are going to get in the way of any kind of, of replication system. And, and again, like in the experiments, the RNAs just get shorter and shorter because we're talking about chemical selection and it's favoring right. whatever molecule reproduces the fastest, which is going to be the smallest molecule. We need, uh, we need functional selection, which is going to ha have a purpose that is um, then somehow retained over all the other molecules that uh, don't have a function. That's actually one of the, that's one of the most well said things I've heard is that um, natural selection is not functional selection. Um, if I recall. It, what is a, it is at the biological evolution level. They, they would say, okay, you're selecting for molecules that give, that confer a reproductive advantage or, um, but I'm, I'm talking about at the, primordial, the abiogenesis level, we don't have that, uh, we don't have replication. You can't have um, evolutionary selection or natural selection until you've got faithful reproduction of that system. So I'm talking about um, molecules that are just randomly forming in a primordial soup. They're going to be chemically selected for, right. even if you could stabilize them with peptide Chemo RNA link, uh, you know, couplings, um, you're only going to be selecting for that, which is the most like thermally stable or that's based on the abundant, the preponderance of uh, the various building blocks and whether they agree with each other or not, whether they um, uh, like, I'm not saying every reaction is possible, but in that pool of molecules, there's going to be a certain percentage of them that can react um, depending on, you know, some of them are going to repel each other. Some of them are going to cause chemical reactions and change in this in the new uh, compound. But um, those, uh, uh, you're not selecting for the molecule based on whether it can say form bonds or um, that has some kind of enzyme activity like uh, transfer an amino group from one molecule to another or um, hydrolyze a molecule or form double bonds, you know, those kind of functions that you need for life. You're not going to be selecting for those. You're only going to be selecting for whatever happens to fit nicely next to its partner and whatever happened to be in higher concentration in the solution and whatever, uh, got there first and whatever survives higher temperatures like you end up with rna with more uh, g's and c's in them than a's and t's because guanine and cytosine form three hydrogen bonds and adenine and thymine only form two so um, you would be selecting for rna that's more thermally stable that would be richer in g's and c's which is going to limit your variability in the code because now you've cut out uh, the percentage of a's and t's to create variability to create variety and what you have said is, that's the money quote. I'll try to remember it. Yep, chemical selection is actually the true natural selection. What um, the natural, uh, the, um, the advocate- Chemical and physical selection. Like, right. You know, temperature gradients, uh, hot, cold cycles, right. wet, dry cycles. Chemical and physical. Whereas what people, what some of the mainstream call natural selection is only fantasized. It's not what really happens in nature. Uh, they say, well, natural selection, they'll, they'll just say it's going to be functional. It's like, uh, that's just imaginary because there's no basis of that in chemistry and physics. The other thing I, there was one other thing I wanted to say, and now it's, I'm getting, I'm getting really forgetful in my old age. I had a <laughs> <laughs> Friday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, if, if I can, they were, it had something to do with, um, as you were talking about the, um, you were talking about the, the chemical side and now it just slips my mind. Uh, but I think it had something to do with functional selection. We can't, Oh, now, I, now I remember Yay. we can't, it's false advertising to say, Oh, we just created the catalytic reaction. And now, you know, we can, they may call it enzymatic. Therefore, we can make other 
reactions, th that's an that's a false extrapolation. So let's say they they modified some enzyme, just some monomeric enzyme, and it can now catalyze a new reaction. It's not appropriate to extrapolate that to something that is uh, for multimeric enzymes. I, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Just because you have a catalytic reaction, say even um, with a 15 polypeptide uh, polymer or 15, 15 mer polypeptide, just because you found a catalytic reaction, there's no way that that should be legitimately extrapolated to say something like a helicase or topoisomerase or polymerase will evolve naturally. But I see that kind of that insinuation all the time. Oh, because we had we were able to do it in small pieces, we can do it incrementally. And it's like, no, that's not going to work for a multimeric enzyme. Uh, the multimeric enzyme only works when you have all the pieces together in very usually they're very large polypeptides and at least well, you know, at least dimers, but then we see some that are, are big. I, I saw some of the ones in the, um, uh, like say metabolic cycles, they're, they're, they're huge. Their quaternary structure is huge. So I just wanted to say that it's illegitimate to allow, uh, just like when molecular alchemy said, look at this little five nucleotide ribozyme. I just, and I just kind of brushed him off, but I didn't justify what I was, I wasn't backing it up because I didn't have time. But now looking back, I said, you know, that, that does not justify the emergence of multimeric enzymes. It, it, it totally fails as an explanation that a multimeric enzyme will succeed because if you just have one, uh, if you just have one part of that, um, you know, one polypeptide floating around, it might catalyze something, but what really makes it work is when it's able to join with its partner. And I don't think that can be built incrementally. Yeah, claiming victory because you found a five nucleotide long um, catalytic function is like saying, well, we got to build a, some kind of house or, or structure or, uh, you know, some, some way of, uh, providing food, uh, and shelter. And you found a piece, a, a little piece of scotch tape like this, and, you know, there's a long way to go before you have a shelter, <laughs> with a little piece of tape. Um, yeah, the other thing is just because you have something catalytic does not equal good or beneficial because catalytic just means it speeds up chemical reactions. But what if that chemical reaction is bad? What if that chemical reaction is I'm going to chop uh, everything with a peptide bond into fragments? You know, like water, you, you know, let's say you're sawing down trees and the saw cutting down a tree takes a long time. Water just being there just by the laws of, uh, of it randomly bumping into these peptide bonds or those, these uh, phosphodiester bonds, um, in the, in the DNA and the proteins, it's going to split it um, without any sort of catalytic activity. It's just that it's a reversible reaction. Condensation and hydrolysis are reversible reactions. So con condensation is needed to take two monomers and link them together. Whether you're talking about amino acids linking together to make polypeptides that then fold into proteins, or whether you're talking about uh, the bases, the, nucle nu the uh, nucleotides um, and getting them to link together water will break those apart, but there's many, many enzymes. There's endonucleases that will cut in the middle of strands and there's exonucleases that cleave off from, from the, the ends and work towards the middle to chop up uh, um, RNA as well as DNA. There's endonucleases for both of those. And by through random chemistry, if you're hoping to get catalytic function, you're also going to get the catalytic ability to speed up the degradation of all your precious RNA and DNA in that uh, random primordial soup. Same thing with proteins. There are many different types of enzymes that chop proteins to pieces. You, know, you might be thinking, well, how come our cells, if we have these enzymes, why aren't they chopping us to pieces? Well, when you eat protein, for instance, you, you create two of those proteins as zymogens. They're, they're precursor enzymes, kind of like, a, it, you know, it's, it's like keeping the the um, acts in a, a sleeve so it can't do any cutting. And then when uh, you eat food and the stomach acid starts being produced, the, the um, chymotrypsin and pepsinogen in their inactive forms become activated when the hydrochloric acid starts being pumped in the stomach. So then you get pepsin and, and uh, trypsin and then they can start chopping up proteins into pieces so that you can reuse those amino acids um, as fuel or to, to build new things in your body. Um, 
So they're not active all the time and they're only active in certain compartments. And, and so these, these proteolytic enzymes are heavily regulated so they don't just go chopping everything up that you work so hard to create. So there, there's a whole component of regulation to that uh, that's involved. So in, a, in, a, in the same kind of random chemistry, this is why I asked the, the question in your debate last night, Sal, is um, how are you going to control and, or, or prevent these molecule, these, these polymers that have, whether it's a ribozyme or whether it's a, an enzyme, that are going to, how are you going to keep them from chopping all your, your valuable stuff into pieces unregulated? Um, Cause it, it will, I mean, some of these enzymes will cut, you know, a thousand um, uh, molecules per minute or per second, you know, they're, they're incredibly fast. So instead of having a saw to cut down trees, now you've got a gas powered chainsaw <laughs> and you have no off button and an unlimited supply of gasoline. I mean, you're just going to cut the entire forest down <laughs> and uh, you know, you, that, that kind of stuff has to be regulated. And so if, if you take away what power, you know, so those, some of those enzymes don't even require e ATP either. Um, they, they will, all they need is like a, a free hydroxyl group and they will um, cut off a, a, a base pair. Um, and some of them do a take up ATP. And if you run out of ATP, okay, that slows down the, enzyme or if you run out of the cofactor that an enzyme needs that will slow it down but that's not how our cells regulate it it regulates it through uh inhibitors and all the mechanisms of, of stop making more enzymes and then the, and then there's other mechanisms mechanisms that will break down those enzymes so they they don't work anymore um so there's so many levels of control and regulation all along the way from assembly of these enzymes to the degradation of the enzymes to prepackaging the enzymes in an inactive form or, or compartmentalizing them in a vesicle so that they can be released all of a sudden and do a quick job instead of waiting for them to be transcribed and translated. But in a uh, primordial soup condition, you don't have all those regulatory mechanisms. You're, you're gonna just as likely get a bond breaking molecule that is going to wreak havoc on, on all of the molecules in the vicinity that uh, that 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 have that bond that it targets and and you did point out something interesting and i actually have another meeting i have a okay. regular friday night meeting i gotta get going too yeah uh you talked yeah. about water being a problem and steve benner pointed out that's the origin of life community knows this not just steve benner they call it the water paradox yeah you, you can't build life with water and you can't build life without it yep. <laughs> it's so they're proposing formamide an earth covered with formamide, that's how, 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 how we were able to solve. It's just like, yeah, you just created a whole other set of problems. Yeah, so, you're, just, you're creating cross-linking molecules that are going to turn everything into a giant ball of tangled uh, garbage, which we call tar or asphalt. And yeah. the other thing they'll say is, okay, well, if you have um, um, wet dry cycles, you know, like a, an area where a thermal pool, you know, drops down and then the molecules dry out a little bit, you know, then you can prevent some of the hydrolysis. But so what, then you've got a molecule that's dried out, stuck to the rock, and the only way for it to participate in any other reactions is to get back in the pool where it can um, serve a function. And as soon as it gets back in the water, water's waiting there to kill it again. Yeah, so um, all this to say, the designer assembled cellular life in a way that just says, no, this isn't gonna happen naturally. Um, that's what the architect, you know, he could have chosen another way to do it. I think you are just responding to to top dog here. Just because an intelligence can make things doesn't mean nature can't make things naturally. Yeah, no, but can no. it do it with uh, um, specificity? I mean, sure, snowflakes can form, salt crystals can form, but uh, and, and you can even um, uh, use um, catalytic surfaces to replicate things, but you, it lacks the 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 sophisticated diversity that you need to um in other words information uh, the the coding in there to um form uh, uh novel uh, functions and then and, you got to be able to replicate it faithfully right. and, and it's the it's the organization and yesterday just briefly um before we go immutable destiny said it's just chemistry there's no need for intelligence i wanted to say that's obfuscation and equivocation no one, no one in the ID community is saying, oh, the, the way a cell works, an 
in normal operation, intelligence is constantly present. That's kind yeah. of an insinuation that That's isn't so correct. Man. But what I wanted to say is we're not talking about the operation. We're talking about the origin. And yeah. it's just like you could say a chemical factory, uh, it's just chemistry that makes it work. I'm just like, well, it makes it operate, chemistry and physics. But the origin, the organization of it had to be planned by intelligence because yeah. you have all these step reactions. And the cell is a chemical factory. That's the issue. Where yeah. did that where did the source of the organization come from? It doesn't happen spontaneously. Yeah. And I really just didn't have time to deal with um, immutable destiny's claim, but that's the thing that speed of sound and immutable destiny keeps saying, oh, it's just chemistry. I'm just like, um, they don't get that's, it. that's obfuscating they the issue. It. Yeah. Well, it's like having a bunch of wind up toys and like, sure, you once you wind them up and you let them go, look, it's operating all by itself through totally natural processes. You know, that spring is releasing the tension and stuff. It's like, well, okay, well, something had to come along to wind up that toy. Something had to, to design the toy to the parts interact with each other. And um... yeah, as a last word, James, I would just like a confirmation from about something which I commonly say to atheists and uh, getting the confirmation from you that would be uh, just reinforcing what I constantly say. Um, for a long time, I believed that the smallest living creature would be um, Picoplasma genitalum, which is about 500,000 nucleotides big. And then about six months ago or so, I discovered actually that this is a pathogen which requires a host to survive and it doesn't make amino acids by itself. So I said, That's why well, it's a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> Yeah, and you cannot use it as a model to say that is the smallest uh, living life form and probably that would be the size of the last universal common ancestor. So I went to search what would be the smallest free living bacteria which makes all the basic building blocks including amino acids and the smallest I did find out is uh, Pelagibacter ubique. That is a, a bacteria which uses about 1.3 million nucleotides. So I made the calculation and in order for you to have the minimal proteome with that size uh, of a genome, you require a chance of 1 to 10 to the 722,000 of power. So that's, and that's if you're only starting with, um, you know, sugars that are in the right-handed configuration for the ribose and amino acids yeah. that are in the left-handed, you know, not all of the tens of thousands of, of xenobiotic and abiotic uh, molecules that uh, would interfere with that. Um, yeah, that, and the other thing is being able to replicate that faithfully. I mean, the polymerase, the DNA polymerase that makes faithful copies of that genome has an editing ability that reduces the error rate to an incredibly low number. You can knock off that part or knock out that part of the, the editase component of the polymerase and the number of mutations um, makes that's that organism viral. reach error catastrophe incredibly yeah. fast. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I know evolutionists, evolutionists want to say, well, you need to have um, some randomness because that's, you know, it's the random formation of, of differences that get selected for through environmental pressures. But you, there, there's a, a very narrow, I'd say almost really um, non-existent <laughs> sweet spot between high fidelity replication and allowing it in enough errors so that you can have variety and variability but uh, to give you an idea of how quickly error catastrophe can occur, um, in uh, one of my uh, undergraduate microbiology classes, we grew these strains of E. coli that had a mutation in just one of their uh, um, repair mechanisms for uh, ultraviolet-induced DNA damage. So um, normally DNA you know, goes through you know, thousands, if not millions of, of um, uh, mutations per day that have to be repaired. And uh, one of those is caused by ultraviolet light. Like if two thymines are next to each other, they form this thymine dimer that makes a kink in the DNA and then the polymerase gets jammed against it. So there's a whole system uh, of, of enzymes. Uh, even in E. coli, there's like three different, at least three different repair um, systems for fixing problems like that, where the DNA gets damaged by ultraviolet light. So just one of those genes was knocked out or, or damaged and not functioning. And we grew plates of them 
both in the dark in a, in a drawer and then on the windowsill. And within a matter of days, every single one of the billions of cells that were in that Petri dish died. There was no new colonies that would grow because they had acquired so many mutations from ultraviolet light that they, they reach error catastrophe. Their genomes were so flooded with mistakes uh, or the polymerases weren't able to uh, slide across the, the DNA and make copies. And, and then of course the RNA polymerase couldn't make its mRNA and then you couldn't make proteins and then the organism dies. Can't make ATP, that's, can't that's do it all its I, enzyme functions. <laughs> that's why so I say is, li life is an all or nothing business. You have to have everything together. Otherwise nothing goes. If you don't have the repair mechanisms right from the, from the go, then happens exactly what you said right now. And uh, what amazed me in regards of the ribosome, I knew that the ribosome has about 13, or 11 or 13 different error check and repair mechanisms during the translation. But when I read that even the assembly process, each single protein is, 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 is a test drive. It makes a test drive if it is proper and only the ones which are correctly synthesized are incorporated into the end product and the end and assembly. So you have error check during the assembly of the ribosome and error check during the, 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 the working of the ribosome. If that is not the uh, evidence of design, then I don't know what is. That is so important too. There's not just error checking in the, when you're copying the genome and there's, uh, there's also editing with the assembly of the protein. And if, it, if there's a problem, you also have to have the ability to clean up that mess. When I was yeah. genetically engineering yeah. E. coli to produce human insulin, uh, some of the things I was genetically engineering them with, uh, it, it made proteins that the cell just couldn't handle. They couldn't fold it, and it, and so it would cause a, a, a problem. So it would, you know, um, bacteria don't have, you know, uh, lysosomes to chop all these up. They have, uh, well, wait, no, they, yeah, they wouldn't have lysosomes because those are organelles, but they, they do have um, proteolytic enzymes to help clean up this mess. But usually what they do is they just, <laughs> They have like a trash heap that they take all these uh, misfolded proteins and clump them together in these inclusion bodies. And um, and you can see them uh, in some cells in a microscope, but it, it just, it has to be able to deal with misfolded proteins. And so our, our cells yeah. have all sorts of uh, uh, enzymes for, you know, uh, you know, either transporting and sequestering them into a compartment where they, they can later be broken down and degraded and recycled and reuse the parts um, or are they wreak havoc? It's like throwing a monkey wrench into a very sophisticated, you know, machine, and, and it, you know, that could that could do some serious damage. Uh, a loose bolt in a in a giant uh, factory machine could make everything screech to a halt. So you've got to make well, sure I, that there aren't just scraps sitting around that are going to cause problems. Well, Cells very efficient at cleaning those up. I've been using that argument, that, and I said, if you do not have the proteasome, uh, which cleans up the mess, if uh, if uh, 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 an RNA strand is, is misfolded and is not work, working pro properly, these these misfolded proteins they will uh, uh, start to to accumulate in the cell, and uh, in the end, I pro I think that the cell would die. Is that correct? Uh, it can, yeah, it, it can be lethal to the cell. Um, happens in humans too when you, there's a common genetic disorder where you don't make enough uh, of your own antioxidant called glutathione. So free radicals damage your hemoglobin and it clumps together in these Heinz bodies in your red blood cells and uh, makes you resistant to malaria. That's why it's so common. Um, this um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase uh, mutation, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it does lead to um, cell death. Those, those red blood cells have to be cleaned up and the spleen and, um, this accumulated uh, damaged protein does can be lethal to the cell. Yeah, we are close to two hours. Um, I would like to give uh, Sal the last uh, word and then you, James, and we will close our stream. So if you have so, some uh, one more question, Sal, you can ask, um, and then I think we, we can end a, this stream here. I just have a quick comment. Uh, Dr. Carter, you inspired me to keep studying chemistry, and I will learn it by trying to teach it and teach uh, Dr. Tan's molecular biology course. So um, thank you. Uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. And I hope uh, some of the viewers will be inspired to study chemistry because these are more the, the level of discussions I, I feel will move forward the intelligent design argument. 
you know, when we get into these levels of details, it's much harder for the other side to put forward their case. They like very ambiguous, vague things. So when you start to get into the specific chemistry and the amount of organization needed, um, the ID argument becomes far more forceful. So thank you for giving us all these facts. And it's just a, a pleasure to just sit here and, and learn and also teach me all the things I need to learn. <laughs> and uh, me too. Extremely grateful. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Al. I, um, I agree that um, we really got to get down to the nuts and bolts uh, of understanding these pathways and mechanisms. And unfortunately, you do have to have enough of a, a background in, in chemistry and biochemistry, molecular biology, cell biology, to even understand the terms that we're talking about. So that's why yeah. I'm grateful that, you, that uh, you know, I think as people start to listen, listen to these talks, even if they're like, oh, what is that? That's a word I don't know. Let me look that up and they'll find a cool animation or video and begin to understand. Um, I've been doing that. I've been learning new terms by listening to your guys' channels. And I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, I, I can't remember that the details of that. Let me look that up again. And then I, I, I come back next time even more uh, uh, prepared to be able to uh, comprehend what the conversation's about. So I know there's some people listening that are like, wow, this is all over my head. And um, so I encourage you to, you know, check out Sal's uh, Reasons um, Academy. Uh, what, what's the the website again? It's uh, Evidence Reasons Academy. Uh, they yeah. can find it just by going to my website, evidenceandreasons.org, and there'll be links to the academy. I only have five chemistry lectures out. I'm going to have to have, just for general chemistry, 240 lectures. Uh, 120 will be the actual lecture because they're short, like 30 minutes. And then um, 120 lectures that are walking through the homework exercises just for, I mean, there are other ways you could learn it. There's the MIT courseware and stuff, but I decided that I needed to improve my professional effectiveness by learning the, a lot of the classes I've forgotten the material. And one way to learn it is to teach it and I said, if I make it a video, I could also do a service to our, our community. So um, maybe if they learn nothing else, they'll see that, well, sometimes you just have to slug through things that you might put you to sleep. And I have to make confession. Sometimes when I've listened to my own lectures, it put me to sleep. <laughs> so I take no offense if people are bored. Uh, if you struggle through it, you know, more power to you. And I'm there just to serve you all. Yes, It's a challenge I when am. you're teaching because you have to be able to read students' faces to see if they're sleeping or, or they have a <laughs> bewildered look on their face. And when you're on YouTube, you can't always uh, know what's going through people's heads. And um, so it, it is a challenge, but uh, I encourage everyone to just keep on learning. The knowledge is power. Um, I mean, the, I was the same way there. I took all these classes for 27 years. I, I took classes and half of that was science classes. And uh, now I'm, I'm teaching it. And a lot of it, like I, I've taught over 15 science classes in the last 10 years. And there's times where I'm like reading the book the night before I'm about to teach it. Like, oh yeah, I, I forgot, totally forgot about this. And or I never really understood that part of chemistry. And, and, and so, yeah, it helps uh, definitely uh, sharpen my uh, skill set by going back and having to teach it and, and relearn a lot of these things. Yeah, what, what I am learning is that we never stop to learn. And this, uh, if you start to, to understand and biochemistry, then you will see that the universe about this world is so huge that even if we studied for our entire life, what we have learned compared to what is out there is just a tiny fraction. And I think that keeps us humble. But um, James, what I, I, I special appreciate about you coming to my channel and interacting with us is that I am uh, constantly lurking at atheist channels and there is people out there. I had interactions with, with PhDs and they are criticizing me and say, oh, Tangelo, he's not learning because he had interactions with PhDs, with, uh, with that guy and with that guy and he still doesn't get it. And tonight I have someone here at my channel, you James, who are also a PhD and I can say I a sign below everything which you said tonight and i am fully in line with what you are saying so i good that means fully... you understood what i was saying <laughs> no i mean i didn't understand everything but i mean okay. we are we are on the same side of the uh, in the same boat let's say like that so um 
uh, if they these guys are criticizing me that I have an inferior understanding than PhDs, which are professional, but I am agreeing fully with what what you are saying, and you have also a diploma in PhD, so then they cannot continue to criticize me that I am wrong because of that. Don't let them lord over that PhD with you. You don't have to have a PhD to be highly knowledgeable. I mean. In fact, usually when you get a PhD, you just become more narrow in your focus and you sort of specialize in one little area and then everything else kind of becomes a distant, foggy mm -hmm. memory. Um, so yeah, it's uh, certainly, it, you know, it takes a lot of work. I, I, I don't think I could go and do it again if I knew how bad it was gonna be, how tough it was to get a PhD. It took me nine years, but partly because my research was so sophisticated and, uh, and some of the, rea the um, uh, experiments took a long time. Like I had these 16 hour long experiments that uh, were just brutal. And, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it don't let that discourage you. There's, I, I, I listen to people on YouTube all the time that don't have PhDs and I feel like, wow, they are really bright. They, they have a higher IQ than I do. They, they know a lot about, uh, this subject and I can learn from them. And, uh, so I, you gotta be humble about, uh, what you know, we don't always know what we don't know either. And, and the way you find out is by, uh, um, engaging in, in people like like we're doing now, yeah, I and, think and reading papers. We, <laughs> I think the more that we we actually learn, the more humble it makes us uh, com compared to that uh, amazing creator which made it all. And uh, we we try just to be um, light in a world which uh, dwells in darkness and uh, pointing to that amazing creator. I mean. It's not about us, it is about God. It's, it's about the one which made it all. And we are just tiny little creatures which try to understand just a fraction of what he did and which points to him. But okay, so I want to end this, this stream. We are two hours here. Uh, James, once again, thank you very much for coming to my, to my channel. And I hope that we can have more of such interactions and I think it's very beneficial because um, this uh, these streams they will remain online for many years and people they will listen to them and learn so if you have time I encourage you to keep doing this we, we have not many PhDs and highly educated Christians which are having the courage to come public and teach us so if you can keep doing that, then I would want strongly to encourage you to do it at sales channels, eventually at mine, at other channels. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone which has assisted to us. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.